All right. What's happening? Yeah. This is, this is really, really cool. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Thad, for that great introduction and for being such a great host. Uh, I've had an awesome day here. I got here early and uh, saw this amazing facility here. Yeah. And um, this is my second time here, but this time I got like the full full tour and I've been doing a lot of content and stuff like Put that. Put you to work, didn't yeah. we? Right, right away. Get to work, John. Right. It's been a, <laughs> been a, been a full day. So um, I just wanted to kind of recognize everybody that uh, made this happen before we go anywhere. Cause right on. I think I'll forget. If I, <laughs> no. Um, so as Thad mentioned, uh, Derek and Matt from Ernie Ball Music Man are here. Thank you guys. Where are they? Somewhere. And uh, they have been taking care of me and uh, doing such a great job and made this happen in coordination yeah. with Sweetwater. So that's great. And um, all the people here, like I said, that has been a great host. Nick Bocott gave me a full tour today. He's been amazing with helping me with guitars and amps and stuff like that. So that's really appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we have Justin. Uh, Shooting a lot of the video and stuff. The whole team, yeah. Yeah, the whole, whole video team. team is out here, yeah. And Jimmy and his team are doing sound. And um, I don't think you guys realize like the scope of what they set up here, but they basically recreated the exact scenario that we set up to record the guitars on the new Dream Theater album. Um, there's so much gear that they were able to get in it's here. It's crazy, so isn't it? That's like insane. So thank you guys for doing that. That's crazy. Right on. Yeah. Right on. And thank you, Mitch. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah. Glad to be here. Absolutely. We're going to have some fun. Yes, we are. So as John said, we have exactly recreated the signal path that they used in the studio, the microphones, the microphone preamps, the summing amp, the uh, overall EQ. And actually, at, uh, a little later tonight, we're going to hear all those different pieces and what they contribute to the sound. So it's going to be something no one's ever heard before outside the studio with you. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little, now that I'm out here, I'm, I'm regretting it because we're giving away all of the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody's going to be able to have a tone like this. I don't know that everybody will be able to have the tone like this. <laughs> There's some limiting factors Two there, right? Two million dollars later. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. So let's dive right in, because yeah. we have a lot we want to talk about. Yeah, tonight. we do. All right, so the new album, uh, you guys came off of The Astonishing, yep. and you kind of went a little bit in the other direction yeah. with Distance Over Time. Right. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the album. Where did the whole thing come from? Sure. So uh, as you said, with The Astonishing, that was our uh, uh, very, very big and ambitious um, concept double album crazy story it took like three years to uh, put together um, full orchestra choir the whole thing this big tour this album uh, is is very different as you said so for this album we decided to go away together as a band actually it was uh, on the suggestion of my wife who was incredibly supportive get out of the house right right or really or wanted to get rid of me um, you know, why don't you guys go away? And you know, we we thought it was all thought it was a great idea. So um, we live on the East Coast, so we went up uh, kind of in the Woodstock area, upstate New York. Although people from real upstate New York don't call that upstate right. New York. That's downstate. It's all relative. Yeah, exactly. If you're from Rochester, it's not. Um, anyway, and we were on this property. It was like a five-acre property property that we found, and on it was something called the uh, Yonder Barn. And uh, what it was, it's, it's uh, basically a barn that, ha that was uh, refurbished into this beautiful studio. And uh, the only thing about it is that it's an empty studio. So basically, you could use it for whatever you want. So, you, know, you can use it for film, for TV. You can do a private event. Uh, you could record there. You could rehearse there. You can have a little concert in there. But there was no recording gear at all. So just this really, really beautiful studio. No recording gear, okay. but perfect for what we wanted to do because we just wanted a place to go to, bring our smokers and barbecues. And bourbon. And bourbon <laughs> and wine and write and hang out just as friends and uh, make music. And that's what we did for about a month there. So your initial plan then was really just to go there to write, yeah, not necessarily exactly. to record. So when did it shift into a full-on recording project at that so, point? So while we were writing, um, we were recording live demos. So our engineer, Jimmy T, who was, uh, who 
recorded the entire record for us. Him, in conjunction with my guitar tech, Maddie, set up a way for us to easily record live demos. So very basic, like my amps direct, uh, four mics on the drums, everything else direct. And you know, as we would write songs, we'd just record them live, and that would be the demo. But we noticed something about those demos. Uh, even with that basic recording setup, they sounded so good. The vibe, the room, the sound of the room, the environment, it was magical. And we were like, let's just record. Isn't this a recording studio? You know, we just need some gear. Let's stay here and record. So that was about a month in. We decided to stay there. It wasn't the plan. Okay, so then you yeah. brought in the gear and, and set it up. Now, is that yeah. barn set up where there's a separate control room and a yeah. recording space? So the way the barn is set up, uh, the main room is a, a big giant room, 30-foot ceilings, really, really beautiful. And the control room is upstairs. So when we were writing, actually, there was a little house on the property, too, that we all stayed at. But it only had enough room for four, and there's five of us. So Mike Mangini slept out in the barn. <laughs> and it, 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 that was his choice, because he likes to stay up late and play Madden football and <laughs> curse at the TV. Um, so, so the control room upstairs was his bedroom. So we kicked Mike out, and uh, you know, basically Jimmy T and Maddie were like, "Okay, you know, give us give us some a weekend," <laughs> and, uh, and they, in conjunction with Rupert Neve Designs and a couple of other companies, they actually built a mobile, you know, setup with Mike Prees, Mike's, you know, Jimmy T brought in his desk. We, Dream Theater has a lot of recording gear already, like Pro to Tools rig and speakers. And I swear they turned the thing into a, a fully operational studio. And we walked in, we we're like, you got to be kidding me. This is ridiculous. Right. Um, so basically, uh, where we were set up with all of our gear when we were writing, we didn't move it, it just stayed put, even the guitar cabinets and everything. And we just mic'd everything up for real and started tracking. Um, and I'm glad we did, because the sound of the record is yeah, really it sounds really phenomenal. Cool. Sounds, sounds great. Cool. So how long did you spend doing the actual tracking phase of the recording? So that took another, like, three months, I guess. You know, okay. everybody, there's 10 songs on the album, so, you know, we did drums first, and, uh, and then started overdub overdubbing from there. So we got in there around June. By September, we were done. Did you have the 10 songs fairly well mapped out before you started recording, or were they just roughs at that point? Um, be, well, one of the things we did while we were writing the music and um, recording those live demos is Jimmy T was like active the whole time like t in taking those demos and then creating a session in, in Pro Tools and mapping out the tempos and getting like a click map and uh, markers and stuff like that. So that by the time we were ready to record, like that pre-production was already done. Okay. Right. So um, then it was just a matter of of getting in there and tracking. You know? Was there much change to them after that point, or did you work pretty much off of what he had? Yeah, we on? pretty much worked off of what we had. If you compare the demos to the album, there's not a lot of change. You know, it's just that, like when you're writing and you're in the moment, you're recording live. You know, you you have your parts, but maybe they're not like a hundred percent sussed out. So they get more like honed in when you're actually tracking. I know that happens to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to really spend the time while we're in the writing mode and the flow is going to like, you know, give me like three hours to get this part exactly the way I want. It's not the time for that. So yeah, so they you know developed from from the demos. Right now, if I if I understand the timeline correct, mm. you had actually come off the road with G three coming into that. Right, correct. That's so true. You, you were already were you already working on song ideas and and solo ideas and things mm. while you were out doing that, or when did that happen? Well, I mean, w what I like to do is uh, I, I'm constantly collecting ideas. So uh, you know, my iPhone is the perfect little handy device. Just you know, when you have an idea, if you have a guitar in your hand, or even if you don't, you want to hum something. I put that down, I have a collection of that stuff. And then um, band members do that same thing in their own way, you know. Um, and then we also have ideas from sound checks that we collect. Okay. And they're little, you know, we might like uh, sort of latch on to like a cool riff or a chord progression. We don't want to lose it, so we'll just record it at sound check. So we had, I don't know, what, you can call them like little snippets, so just like little ideas, like a riff, a chord progression, a melody. Um, and we had all that stuff to choose from. But 
a lot of it was just done right on the spot, you know. Okay. And those things you kind of use as, you know what, I need to have the perfect riff. Hold on a second. And go through it. Uh, and some of that stuff spawned songs. Some was used in the middle of a song. But most of it was just done, you know, together while we were there, mm -hmm. enjoying the whole vibe. So how yeah. collaborative was the writing on this album? 100% collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was in the room. Everybody was active and invested. And, you know, I think the, the environment that we set up, it was like so relaxing. Um, the barn had big windows. You can see outside, watch the day turn into night. You can see the UPS guy pull up when you were getting new gear. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'd like in between literally would barbecue and like smoke and not smoke. That smoke, smoke but meat. yes, <laughs> smoke meat. The... Yeah, <laughs> smoking chicken. There you go. <laughs> Gets you really high. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and uh, you nobody know, had to go anywhere, drive anywhere, so you can have like a drink at night, hang out, and then you you know, eventually uh, call it a night, and you know you'd wake up the next morning, smell like bacon and eggs, go down there, I mean Jeannie's like cooking, and you start to talk about this riff from last night. So it was like this, like all you know, immersive kind of environment. And so I think that made everybody really, really happy to be a part of it and contribute. So the, the collective nature was probably more than ever before. Right, while. right. But you were the producer on, yeah. the, on, the, on the album. Right. What is your role then, given that the five of you were collaborating so tightly? So my role, uh, the way I like to look at it is to make sure that it all happens. <laughs> You know, that's the, the, the simplest way to put it. So, you know, one of the important things that we do is we do talk about what we want to do before we go in. You know, so we try to get everybody on the same page. So that's part of my role is to kind of, you know, figure out what the next thing is that we're going to do. Talk about that with everybody and say, yeah, you know, we want to write, go in there and, and make an hour long record with maybe some more concise songs and make it real heavy and proggy and like have a lot of shredding and you know, it, if somebody comes back and says, nah, I don't really want to do that, I want to do something else, then, you, you know, you're going to butt heads, and when you get in there, not everyone's going to be on the same wavelength. So part of my job is to make sure we're all together, and then to figure out the best way to do that, so which guys to hire, and where to do it, and how to do it, um, and then make sure that everything we do is contributing towards that goal. Right, so that we don't like go off the rails, and all of a sudden, something that we set out to do is completely not what we set out to do. Right. All right, so as a producer, I have to kind of just like keep the machine moving, keep everything in check, make sure that the, you know, we're reaching our, our goals, right. basically. So how do you know when you've gone too far with it, or when you're we're pushing past where it should be? You know, as as a musician involved with it and a and a composer involved with it. You can know. be close to it, right? Yeah, and, uh, not, yeah. I mean, I think that's what's great about having other people involved, like our engineer, um, you know, like our mixer, Ben Gross, who did an amazing job on that, and having some people that you can kind of use to, like, bounce things off of and get their different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important, because you could get, like, really, like, invest, I'm sorry, to, uh, like, in your little bubble and... In your own world, too yeah, close to it. yeah, too close to it. So right. it's great to have people like that that is supportive, and of course the the band guys as well. Right, you know they're great like that as well. So then when you uh, you take off the producer hat, you take off the composer hat, yeah. the, the writer hat, and you put on the guitar player hat. Right. Then how does that change how you look at what you're working on? Um, I, I mean, in, in a way, it, do, it doesn't change in that you know the guitar needs to sort of contribute to everything that we talked about doing you know if we talked about making a certain record that was that was really um you know more organic heavy um we want more of a live feel then i need to approach the guitar that way right so in this record i didn't record i barely recorded any rhythm tracks if i was playing a solo so it's a very live sounding album this is what dream theater would sound like if we were playing live the guitar would drop out and there would be a solo you just hear bass, keyboards, and drums. Um, the sound that I went for was like just more ballsy and primal, I guess. We used a room mic for the first time to kind of capture the spirit in the room, you know. Um, so as a guitar player, I'm still wearing the producer hat because I'm trying to like make sure that I'm staying on track as well. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And I would imagine coming off the road with G3 that 
your chops are up. Chops you've, you've are been, up. You've been playing a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 80 shows with G3. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then writing the record. And then I did a guitar camp. It's my second camp I did on Long Island. And I had like the most amazing guitar players on that camp. Al Demiola, one of my big heroes. Um, Guthrie Govan, Tony McAlpine, Rusty Cooley, Jason Richardson, Andy James. Um, I don't want to forget anybody. Just John Finn. Um, am I forgetting anybody? I hope not. That would be horrible. Yeah. Um, but we did that, you know, the, the camp, and then literally that was one week, a Monday through Friday. That Monday, I recorded my guitar solo. So my head was just like spinning with inspiration and licks and riffs, and right. you know, just just from just coming off of jamming with uh, some of the most amazing players. Tosin Abasi, did I mention Tosin? Um, yeah, it was pretty pretty sick. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So you did the solos then all at once? Did you yeah. did you save all that till the end? I saved or? it to the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were the vocals done at that point or did they No. The vocals were being done. So the vocals were kind of like happening and and being done. They kind of happened more towards the end. Um, because as the music is being written and the the songs are being recorded, lyrics have to be written and uh, that takes some time. So the vocals were done like more towards the later half of the recording. All right, I see. So I think now would be a great time. Yeah. You mentioned the guitar tones and yeah. the sounds that you were using. We've got this rig here. Why don't we take a walk through what we have and yeah. we'll demonstrate for you guys how this all comes together and contributes to the sound that you actually hear on the on the record. Sounds good. Let That's me good. grab a guitar. Right on. I think everything works pretty well. Yep. Yeah. Oh, let's see. What do we got? You probably have a Majesty. I have a Majesty. Uh, okay, this guy. Actually, where is the green? Right there. It's awful to have so many to choose from. It's just so uh, tough problem, right? What's that? <laughs> tough problem to have. Which one am I going to play? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know what's really cool? That's a little bit too high. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. When we were writing, we brought all our gear into the yonder barn, and my tech. Had brought like all my guitar, not all of them, but like enough so that I can choose any tuning for any song as we were writing. Nice. Right? So if it felt like a song should be on a B flat baritone, I can grab that. Or on a guitar tuned, you know, to D or drop A seven string or whatever. They're mm -hmm. all there. So that was really cool. And everything was done using the Majesty? Yes, except for acoustics. Well, two songs okay. were the BFR baritone. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Everything else is matched. So obviously you got it all figured out with this guitar to give you everything that you need for what you're uh, oh, man. for what you're doing. Sure do. Okay. Let's see. Turn it on. I'm tripping over my waters. Well, there's more here. <laughs> setup that I have right now is actually it, it's a little closer to like when we were writing the record because my I brought in my touring rig which is a stereo rig like this right. the difference is it uses uh, an axe effects for the effects and some pedals and it's all in a rack uh, whereas this we have laid on the, on the floor right. in a little bit different way but this is kind of more of the you know, the way I was writing the record okay. and recording in stereo. But then when we actually went to track, I like basically shut off one head and kept the mics where they were and just used the one right. in mono. Yeah. So take us through the guitar signal path that we have here today sure. and, and what it's contributing to what you're doing. Okay, cool. So, um, and we'll, we'll get to the, uh, the new guitars in more depth, but uh, it started with the guitar. So my Ernie Ball Music Man, um, it, for the most part, Majesty. Um, in the uh, case of this particular setup, this is a stereo setup. So there's two JP2C Mesa Boogie heads. Um, out of the guitar, we go into a TC Electronic Polytune tuner and into my um, signature Dunlop Wah. I know Thad mentioned it before, but it's really cool that Sweetwater actually sells every piece Everything. that I've had the, uh, the pleasure and the honor to develop with these amazing iconic companies. That's awesome. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, so uh, then the wah goes into the front of the amp. 
And then um, out of the effects loop send of, we'll call that the main head, we go into um, my TC Electronics, uh, electronic, it's not plural, plural yes. electronic, electronic, yes, <laughs> um, Dreamscape, which is a modulation pedal, and then stereo out of that into uh, a TC Electronic flashback, which is the delay pedal, and then one of those outputs goes back into the effects loop of the master head, so that's into the effects return. And the other one goes into the effects return of the slave head, I guess you can call it. And um, that's what gives you the stereo effect. Right. And uh, the foot switch for the JP2C is, uh, the, it switches actually both heads because they're MIDI together. So these head, heads have MIDI as well. Right. And these are 4 by 12 rectifier cabinets, correct? Yeah, these are 4 by 12 recto cabinets, yep. So those are Vintage 30 speakers? Yep, Vintage know? 30s, exactly. Right. Yep. Demarzio How about if we... Uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. The guitars all have DiMarzio pickups. I've been playing DiMarzio forever and ever and ever. Right. Yeah. Right. So what, what I was going to ask you to yeah, do yeah. Is, is maybe you could show us the clean tone, show us what the chorus sounds like, what the delay is doing, and then hear the dirty tones as well, just so we can get an idea of what each yeah, of those just, tones are Yeah, just for with. starters. So, so for the clean, you know, for something like this, um, first of all, the, the, uh, the flashback is set up to do like a ping pong stereo type of thing with a dotted eighth type of rhythm, which is one of my favorite type of things. So you're going to hear that kind of stereo sound. So for a clean sound, you know, with the amp, I guess uh, you, you got to be careful of certain things. You know, I like to sort of scoop the mids with a clean sound, um, give it a lot of low end, and then ha sort of crank up the very pristine top. So what you end up with is with this sort of glassy, articulated clean sound, which is really good for arpeggiated parts, which is really the way I use clean a lot in, in composing. So this type of... So that would be like the, the clean sound. And um, it sounds huge here. Oh, yeah. what, what do you guys think? I mean, that, yeah. that's a huge clean tone, right? Right. So do me a favor and turn off the chorus and the delay. Let's yeah, hear just sure. the amplifiers. Yeah, so the amp is, is also the way that um, I designed the, the boogie uh, with, with Mesa Boogie. So, so my JP2C is a, it's two things. It's a reissue of the uh, fabled Mark 2C+. Um, but it's also a very modern version of that with three channels, two separate graphic EQs, uh, cab clone, MIDI, and all this stuff. But what we did when designing the first channel is to make sure that it was a really clean channel. Um, the pickups in these guitars have pretty high output, so I didn't want it to clip at all. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of headroom. And there's a big-ass transformer in that... that uh, that head that has a lot to do with it and everything. Right. So yeah, without that, you can hear. So that's the kind of sound. Right, and then add the chorus in. Yeah, chorus. Absolutely. This is fun. <laughs> and the, the modulation pedal, you can do let's see. Choices. Yeah. 
So I, I have to ask, why do you choose a dotted eighth for your repeat on the delay rather than a quarter note or a straight eighth note? Right. Um, I like the way it, it, the delays are offset from each other, so they don't sort of step on one another. Mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of staggered, so you can hear them a little more clearly. Okay. Yeah. Right. Especially when there's more information coming at you. Okay. Yeah. Right. So now the, the JP2C is a three-channel amplifier. Yeah. Exactly. So do you use the same effects when you're using the crunch or the rhythm channel? Well, um, for, for tonight, I will use the same effects. I mean, with um, when, you know, my live rig, I have the option with uh, some more pedals and the axe effects to do a bunch of different effects mm -hmm. depending on the sound. Um, but uh, for this purpose, I, I guess I'll leave these the same. Okay. Keep it fair so you can hear how they sound with the rig. I'll go back to the chorusing sound. So, um, so channel two on, on this amp, channel two and three are basically clones of each other, although three is a little tiny more high gain. Um, and basically what I go for, you know, when dialing in like a heavy sound is this, uh, I guess it's a balance between, you know, making the gain uh, sound distorted enough where it sounds aggressive but that it's not just flubby and breaking up. So Dream Theater has a way of playing where there's a lot of tight stop start sort of rhythms with the drums, so the amp needs to be able to do that. And of course, the Boogie does that better than any other amp out there. It's just a, that Boogie uh, Mark series sound. Um, so part of that is uh, your gain, part of that is being really sensitive with the bass control. And I guess we'll share these settings, but the bass control is really low. Um, treble acts as another gain stage, and the presence is something that's really special too, because that's on the power amp side of it. So that will like open up the sound and make it more, make it jump out of the the uh, cabinet more. Right. And the other component that's really important is the graphic EQ. And you know, you'll notice uh, I kind of do the classic thing where we sort of pull out the mids and boost the lows and the highs, and so you get this more of a 3D sound. So. Dialing in the, in the sound is like the first step because, you know, whether it's a new Dream Theater album or it's a live show or it's this what we're doing right, if it's not coming out of the cabinet right, you know, then it's not going to sound good anywhere else. Right. So. Are those graphic EQs the same on, on, the, on the three channels or do they switch when you change channels? So they're going to switch. Yeah. So for um, channel two, I have graphic EQ one, channel two, graphic EQ two. Okay. Yeah, so, you, so that was one of my requests with the amp. So when you go to a lead sound, you can slightly change up, you know, maybe roll off the highs or add some middle or whatever. Right. Yeah. Let's hear channel two. All right, so channel two is going to be like more of a heavier thing. I can shut off these for a second. So. <laughs> That's channel two. That has that big, big, heavy boogie thing. Do you often yeah. use chorus and delay with that channel as well? I do. So you know, for for uh, when I'm playing like the chorus to a song, um, it's the best time to put on the chorus. So a lot of those more ringing note type of things, oh. right? makes it wider and you know makes like when you're uh, playing s open strings and letting them ring it creates a really cool sound with that uh, do I have the chorus I do hold on this is right yeah all right and the delay will kind of just give it a little bit more width as well with that on
So that's cool. Nice big wide sort yeah, of sound. Definitely, definitely a big yeah. sound. And what about Channel 3? So Channel 3 is, uh, you know, I, I kind of use it in a way where I set up a little bit more gain. So the notes have like more. <laughs> So they're going to be like a, a little more creamy, have a little bit uh, more, what's the word? They, they kind of flower as they... <laughs> This, well, <laughs> since there's a lot of gain, if you stop playing, if you're standing right in front of a loud app, you're going to get that nice feedback. Or maybe not so nice. I, don't know. I got the best of, seat in the house, man. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I kind of like that, um, that stereo delay that I'm talking about. It's, it's just like that type of sound lives for that, you know. Right. I, I really, really enjoy that, you know, because the notes, um, let's see. Kind of like. I think, uh, you know, when playing leads, that, that delay thing is really important. It kind of creates this air around the notes. Right. So you're not using reverb. Then you're just I'm not using, using reverb. I'm not a fan of reverb on mm -hmm. guitar. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the next part of the equation then mm -hmm. was how you captured this in, in the studio. Sure. And uh, we have three microphones. And the microphones are set up. There's three microphones in each cabinet. Yeah. And they're the same ones, same type of ones that were used in your studio. Right. So there's a Mojave MA-301 which is a condenser microphone. Yep, and that's and, probably, probably the main part of the sound right? coming from that. Yep. Right, and then a Royer R121, which is mm -hmm. a ribbon microphone. Yep. And the ribbon hears the way your ear hears and tends to have a nice full bottom end, lower mid range. Absolutely, too. yeah, right. that'll give that kind of girth to the bottom. Right, yeah. and then finally there's a Shure SM7B, which most people think of as the, the Michael Jackson vocal mic from, ah. uh, from Thriller, right? Gotcha. That's, that's yeah. what you use for that or for, yeah. you know, but it, it works great on this too because yeah. it's basically like a slightly beefed up SM57. Yeah, and I think it adds like, um, it, it's, it's a bit of clarity in teeth, you know, so it, I think it helps to make the sound more 3D for sure. So behind John, we have the microphone preamps, and what was happening is the six microphones were feeding into six Rupert Neve Designs Shelford channels. Now, the Shelford channels have transformers input and output. They have a microphone preamp and also built-in EQ and compression, so it's an entire recording right. strip right in one, one unit. So you've got six of those very high-end uh, uh, preamps that you were, yeah. you were applying. Yeah, you know, we, again, the people at Rupert Neve Designs are really, really generous in lending some uh, gear to us, and we purchased a bunch of stuff, but, you know, by the, we, we needed a lot of channels to record our band, and, uh, you know, we're so grateful for that. And, you know, the fact that um, you have all that versatility in that one 
you know, like you said, it's like a complete channel strip, basically. Right, yeah, you tweak everything yeah. right there. Yeah, it's amazing. So the, the microphones were then coming into a Phoenix Audio Nicerizer, which is a summing mixer. So that brings all those together so you can right. record those all at once. Right. So they weren't going to separate tracks then. No. They were being yeah, pre-mixed. So, right. So once we kind of got the sound that we settled on, that we liked, that's what went down. Yeah, All so right. you make some decisions. There you go. Be a man about Commit. it. Commit. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the output from the Nicerizer was going into a JDK R24, which is a stereo parametric EQ, just for talking to Jimmy T, just a little bit of final tweaking right. just to kind of tweeze it into shape. Yeah, at the, very, at the very end. Exactly. So the opportunity we have here tonight for you guys is we have this set up so that we can record all these microphones separately so we can hear what each one of those sounds like, and then you can hear the composite sound that John had for the album. We were listening to this earlier, and it's, yeah. it's, it's kind, of, kind of thrilling. It's pretty incredible. Again, like I, I can't believe that these guys actually did this. <laughs> you know, recreated all this this exact setup that we had in the studio. It's pretty amazing. I'm very blown away by by the fact that you guys did that. So the one thing we didn't yeah. uh, dis discuss and that we're not actually using tonight is yeah. the, the room microphone is a Rupert Neve Designs RNT, oh, right. which is an active ribbon microphone. We've got one on the stand over here, but that was placed about 16 feet back. Yeah. So basically, like I said, that room that we were in had a lot of character. You know, while we were recording there at the studio, um, you know, we'd look outside and see deer and badgers. And one, one night, some bears came up to the studio, which was interesting. <laughs> um, you know, so th there was personality in that room. So that room, you know, even just for the, uh, the spirit of it, you know, we like ever so slightly snuck it into the guitar sound. It just like... You'd be surprised that a little bit of character that that adds actually makes it sound that much, I don't know, alive. It's just really cool. I'm not a fan of like a, an echoey, washy guitar sound unless you're going for some special effect. I like guitar to be like really in your face, like you're sticking your head in the cabinet. Um, so I'm not, we'd never use room mics. So this is the first time that we used one and we just barely snuck it in and, it, you know, it, it's a cool sound. Right. Yeah. So let's uh, let's record a little bit of you playing. Sure. And then we'll listen back to some of these microphones. So you guys set back there? I can't see them, so. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll play a little bit of uh, the album's opening track, the main riff, which is Untethered Angel, because that has kind of like a heavy lower part. Let me make sure I'm in tune here. Yeah. This is all on one string, so I just need to tune one string. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One other thing that's worth mentioning, so I was saying before that the way the studio was laid out, uh, it's a big giant barn, we're in the main room, and the control room is upstairs. So all of our gear was still on the floor, but I was tracking in the control room upstairs. Um, there wasn't really a way to run a guitar cable down there, so um, we used these boogie clear link boxes. Um, to send uh, an unbalanced signal down and convert it, uh, or, you know, to the right um, impedance right. to go into the front of the amp and then come back up. So it's really, really a cool way to do that. Um, and it worked perfectly. Right. Otherwise, you run a long cable, you lose highs, you lose signals. Exactly. Yeah. So those clear, clear link boxes worked perfectly. Awesome. Yeah, that was cool. All right. So let's see. The untethered angel. How's it go again? Okay. <laughs> All right, we recording? All right. Hold on. Tuner. You know what? Hold on. I don't want to do that with delay. Sorry about that. This is what happens in the studio, too, if you get to turn something off. Okay, so, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> One string. One string. <laughs> One string licks. Those are the best ones. So if all the other ones break, you're still good. <laughs> <laughs> Always got the one. Yeah. 
So let's listen to the, the condenser microphone, the MA301, which was the bulk of the, yeah. the, the body of the signal. Right, exactly. Let's listen to that one by itself. Awesome. All right. That sounds Already beefy. sounds good, right? That so could now be let, it right there. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> a lot of times that's what people would go with, right? right. Is, is that. Yeah. But we have the option, or you had the option, yeah. then of mixing in other microphones. So let's yeah. listen to just the Shure SM7B, which is a dynamic microphone. Yeah. Awesome. You can hear how different that sounds, right? Yeah. There's that upper mid-range kind right. of a bite to it, it not does. quite as much bottom end. And even that, that, that sounds great on its own as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now the Royer Ribbon microphone. A lot of bottom end. Yeah, there. a lot of bo bottom end. You can hear what kind of role that's going to play. That's going to fill in, you know, right. the low stuff, especially like on this record. So this guitar is tuned down to C. There's a bunch of seven string stuff. There's baritone stuff. You want like that that weight of the guitar to be captured. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So now we'll play the MA301 and we'll add the other two microphones in so you can hear the, the final composite result. If yeah. you so let's start with the MA301 again. <laughs> Now I'll add the 7B, the SM7B. So you can really hear how that's filling in that upper mid-range. Absolutely, by yeah. It, right. it totally, it's like, uh, you know, it, it almost sounds like you uh, did something with the EQ, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of bring something out, but it's like, the, I think it's adding some girth as well. Right. Yeah. Now we'll bring in the Royer, so we'll have all three microphones together. That's it. That's a big sound. That's a big sound. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> right. So very cool. Nicely really done, cool. guys. Yeah, they, that, and they, they did a lot of work to get those microphones set yeah. in the same places. They worked off photographs to get everything all placed. That's great. I mean, that, that, that's killer. Right there, that, that's an album guitar sound, you know. And, and what we did is, like, we dialed that in, and then that was the sound. So then you just go from song to song, basically. Right. You know, once you got that down, you're all set. Right. Yeah. So cool. That's great. Very cool. So speaking of songs, yeah. let's let's dive in. You mentioned Un yeah. Untethered Angel before, and I think that's the first one you have on your list over here. Uh, yeah. You know, um, there's a couple of different things uh, that, that I wanted to mention about this song. So this was the fourth song that we wrote um, in the sessions, and it, it uh, as soon as we wrote it, we kind of like knew it would be the album opener, and it was also the lead off track that we introduced uh, people to. Um, as far as a single. And so it's the first thing people heard. So it's very uh, Dream theater E, I guess. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of like, um, you know, uh, riffs in it. Uh, there's a lot of melodic sections. There's um, solo trade-offs and unisons and, you know, some fast parts and things like, you know, kind of has everything in there. But um, I wanted to sort of point out a couple of compositional things and recording things. I have with me uh, not only the tracks, but I actually have the isolated tracks as well. So I can kind of point out some things that uh, I'm talking about. So um, I guess one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, how sometimes I, I layer 
um, octaves to make a section uh, a little bit more dramatic. Um, and so I guess the best way to do that, let me see. I'm going to play um, the actual track first so you can hear the section. And then I'll show you like the, um, a breakdown of the isolated guitar tracks and then what I was actually doing. So I have to kind of move around. Just bear with me as I go through the song. I don't have the, exactly where the time is, but let's see. So that's that heavy sound. That's, I mean, basically what we just did here, that's, that's on the record. That's like almost exact. Yeah. That's crazy. So you hear that almost has like, a, it has a very like modal Egyptian-ish kind of sound. And I don't know if you can hear it, but that second octave coming in helps to bring that out. It's almost like a Zeppelin-y, Cashmere-ish vibe. Um, so let's see, if we go to the, uh, the stems on the guitar, you can hear clearly what I did. Let's see, I'll try to go the same section. <laughs> Right, so basically what's happening there is that kind of riff that... Um, oh, I was on the wrong pickup. That could have sounded so much better. And also you, you'll hear these are from the mix, so you hear at the end of that, that kind of brought out. So that's like a mixing technique also to make that little part a little heavier. And then overdubbed on top of. And then ultimately you get to. Right, so that contributes to that kind of heavier sound. Right. Yeah. Right. So then, when you uh, when you take this out on tour, which yes. you guys are going out on tour in about three weeks, yes. Right? Uh, how do you choose what parts to play and what you're going to focus? Right. Good. Good uh, question. So you have to kind of make that choice if that part is important enough that you want to sort of do something about it. So I guess the hard part, I could put an octave on that with the X effects, um, but I need to step off of it when I play the power chords at the end. Um, so it might be some footwork there, but uh, that's how I would do that. You know, I would play the main part down low and either not worry so much about the octave, you know, keep that for the album, or I'd use a harmonizer to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, another thing is, is sort of um, a technique of building a song as it goes along. I mean, this, this isn't a very long song, but it is, let's see, how long is this song? I don't know, it's uh, probably six minutes or so. Um, but um, the chorus happens, I think, three times. So by the time it gets to the third one, um, I, I usually want to do something to lift that. And so let me show you something that I would do to kind of build that up. So the main chorus um, kind of works off of the motif that started the song, which is that whole... Uh, but um, it's outlining more of a progression. So it's going to be like this. All right, so when I'm playing that and I'm resting on, um, well, this guitar is tuned down to C, so that would be an F, not an A chord, that'd be an F minor. Um, I'm just kind of playing a power chord, uh, the first two choruses, so it sounds like this. Uh. 
right? So what I did on the third chorus is sort of um, elaborate on that F minor by adding some open strings and some chordal movement to that. So I'll do it with a clean first so you can hear. I'll put the chorus sign. So I'm going to add that chord in there. So when it goes... Then... Right, so the guitar now is, is kind of expanding and getting a bit bigger for that final chorus. So let me see if I can find the two different versions. All right, let's see. So that's like the first chorus. You can also hear the chorusing on that, right? That's a good example of that. Um, and then when we get to the ending chorus, if I can find that, let's see, you're going to hear the change. Right, so you hear the difference there. All right, so the first one. And then the later one. So tell us a little bit about this C tuning. Are you just dropping the entire guitar down two whole steps? or And right. do you restring with heavier strings when you do that? Or yeah. tell us about that. Exactly. So the guitar is tuned down to C, meaning, yes, the whole guitar is tuned down two steps. Um, so now instead of uh, the low string being an E, and uh, it, the whole thing is just down two steps, yeah, down to C. And so we do, what we try to do is um, use a gauge that's gonna feel, I use tens on my guitar, my standard tune guitar, so we try to use a gauge that's gonna feel like the tension of, of tens. Okay. Yeah, because you don't want them too thin and wobbly. They have to have some sort of resistance. Uh, this way, when I go from one guitar to the next, it, fe it all feels right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and what was the choice, or what was the, the uh, indicator I'm not saying it very well, but what yeah. led you to tune to C for that part? Sure. To, to, for that song? So originally, um, you know, we were talking about the collaborative nature of the album. So originally, John Myung, our bass player, brought in this riff, the, the main one that I played in the beginning. But he was playing it more um, like on a higher bass string in like a tool sort of way, I guess. I, you know, I don't know what string, but he was standard tune and he was kind of up here like a. You know, that kind of thing. And um, when I heard that, I, for some reason, my mind went to, that would sound like really badass, like on a seven string, down on a B, or, you know, and because I had all the guitars laid out, let me grab that C and hear what it sounds like. So immediately, so I, I did that and dropped that riff down to the lowest string, and it turned into the, the riff for the song. So it's just the way I heard it, you know? And uh, I think it worked out really good. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So one of the other standouts for me of this song mm -hmm. is the trading solo section yeah. with you and Jordan. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so something's really, I, I want to tell you guys something really cool about that. This is something that um, it isn't really the normal way to do this, I guess. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But um, so there's a section of the song where we, it goes back and forth, guitar solo, keyboard solo, guitar solo, keyboard solo, and then we do a unison. Um, you'll hear during the guitar solos that there's no rhythm of guitar, once again. So it really, again, feels like, you know, just the band playing live. But what Jordan and I did this time around is I recorded the guitar solos first. And then he, re like, I basically I finished all the guitar tracking. And then he tracked his keyboards. He meaning Jordan, our keyboard player, Jordan Rudis. Um, and so when it came time for him to, to comp basically behind the guitar solo, because it is so naked, there's no rhythm guitar, 
you know, we did some fun things like just, even though it's a heavy song, like just comp piano behind the guitar solo. Um, but what he did is, uh, since the guitar solo was already laid down, he um, comped his chords to my solo instead of the opposite, I guess. Um, so instead of me playing to changes, I was just playing to like a basic riff and then um, play the solo. And within that solo, I'm kind of doing like playing some diminished arpeggios. And um, I have sort of like some uh, modal stuff going on, like. Um <laughs> some stuff like that so Jordan like you know listened to that and then played like his chord movement to match that um, there's a section let me see if I can get to it and uh, I'll, sh I'll show you what he's playing and you know I did what was this one thing <laughs> playing it exactly right but something like that um, anyway he kind of matched that let's see if I can find that yeah uh, come on <laughs> get to that section okay so here would be the comp like So you can kind of right. see the way he's sort of matching what I'm doing there. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of the opposite of what you expect, right? Yeah, Usually so the it, soloist is playing with the right. changes. Right, and it makes me sound like a lot hipper because it's like, <laughs> oh wow, man, John's really playing all those chord changes. So even things where I'm playing like these sort of diminished things going up, like, you know, he he like do these rising diminished chords going up. So yeah, it's really cool. Um, and then finally, there's there's one section where um, you really get the sound of like the full live band because we do this thing where uh, we're both playing a, a basically a melody part. It's like a unison part in harmony, and we're split left and right, and the bass is just pumping along like Iron Maiden style. Yep. And uh, it's just a really, it kind of just really. To me, it's like a peek inside to like what that room sounded like when we were jamming in it. Um, it's one of those moments on the record that just has that sound. So let me find that for you. Uh, let's see. It's kind of later on. Yeah, so you could just hear us kind of jamming away in that room, in that whole part. I'm forgetting all my parts. Yeah, something like that. So is it harder to be the guy who comes up with the melody and has to harmonize, or the other way around? I think it's uh, it's harder for the harmonizing guy, yeah. you know. Usually, uh, that you know, if it's a part that I came up with, 
like it feels good under you know as a guitar player and then Jordan has to work something out and a lot of these parts will work out together first anyway okay um, I don't know if I can play that whole thing ah. that part so that's cool it was fun yeah anyway yeah so uh we'll move on to another song but uh right that was fun so you need to switch guitars for the, the next song and the yes. song we're going to talk about is barstool warrior barstool correct? warrior right, which i love that title all right very you. evocative <laughs> what does it mean <laughs> we will find out hold that for you yeah thanks the least oh, i could do keep stepping on my water bottles somebody's I'm going to have a major spill, and that'll be great for YouTube. What do you guys think so far? <laughs> All right. We should talk about the guitars, probably. So this is one of the new Majesties, correct? Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can get into that. I can hold this up, or you're going to sit down. Right. Well, you need the cable, so. need the cable. Yeah, we should probably get into... Uh, these beautiful instruments up here. A bit. Sure. All right. So um, all of the guitars that you see up here on stage, these are the 2019 Ernie Ball Music Band Majesties. Um, they are available as of, what, April 1st, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, they were debuted at NAMM. And um, basically, just to go through them really quickly, they're all neck through designs. Um, they all have my DiMarzio signature pickups called a Rainmaker and a Dreamcatcher. Dreamcatcher is in the bridge, Rainmaker in the neck. And uh, everyone is more beautiful than the next. Uh, there's two opaque versions, which I think are over there. So that blue one you see is called kinetic blue. That's kind of a color shifting paint, depending on how the light hits it. And uh, that's a mahogany through design, and the, the guitar is basswood, so basswood sides. And the, um, yeah, there it is. That's crazy. It's like that's purple beautiful. or blue or whatever. Or green. Mood you're in. It really depends on how the light's hitting. It's green when I hold it like that. It's green. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a mood guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the uh, the stealth is the other opaque version that has black hardware, and that's also mahogany neck through. Uh, with a basswood body. Um, the other ones that you see there, so what do we got on the end there? Okay, so the ones that you see that have um, the maple top and, and you can see the wood through, those are a uh, full mahogany guitar. So mahogany neck, mahogany sides, and um, that one's called the Red Sunrise. I love these names. We always like spend a lot of time on the names. Um, Let's see, we have the one over here is called Dark Roast because it looks like coffee. Um, the one, the green one next to it, Enchanted Forest, I love that name, perfect. And then the one on the end is Blue Hanu because it's very Hawaiian looking to me. And so again, all those um, mahogany neck through, mahogany body, uh, maple top on the shield in the center of the guitar, um, ebony fretboard, stainless steel frets. Mm -hmm. They all have a piezo system in them as well. So you can select between magnetic and piezo, which we haven't really talked about, but I use that live to go from an uh, amp sound to an acoustic sound, which is really amazing. And then finally, we come to this. Now, this is a limited edition guitar. There's only 300 of these uh, made, six and seven string. And um, this one we call the Tiger Eye Majesty. You can tell from the look of it. Aptly named. It's gorgeous. Thank you. And um, the difference with this guitar is that uh, this is an, a mahogany neck through as well, but the uh, guitar is made out of alder. So this is, you know, we have the two basswood ones, the four mahogany, 
and this is an alder guitar, so it's going to have a bit of a different flavor to it, I think, in the middle, in the upper mid. Um, also, the other ones have the, um, the maple only on the shield part. This one is a full maple top that you can see. So this is going to be a bit of a brighter sounding guitar, and that maple is carried onto the headstock, so there's really cool details. And the back of the neck is a three-piece neck, so with a maple strip down the, the back and also up there on the top. Um, absolutely gorgeous guitar. Again, different flavor. The cool thing is that I was able to get this guitar uh, in time to record, and so the song Barstool Warrior, which we'll talk about, actually has this guitar on it, so you can really hear the tone. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. So while you're reattaching the strap, what is it about the basswood that made you want these two to be made with that as the bodywood? Well, I, I mean, I've been playing, you know, basswood versions of guitars for a really long time. The very first Music Man JP signature guitar was basswood. And there's something about that light wood that has a really tight low end to it. And just, it's great for rock and metal. It's a really, really cool, cool sound. It's light as well. Um, the mahogany guitars are a little bit heavier. They're, all the Majesties are really light, um, but the Basswood is like really, you know, you can play a three-hour show on that thing. Right. No nice. problem. All yeah. right. So tell us about the genesis of Barstool Warrior. Where did the song come from? Okay. So um, on this record, we have uh, a whole bunch of different types of songs, I guess. And uh, this one kind of is more of a throwback to like, Rush meets like 70s prog Genesis kind of vibe. Um, and I want to show you some how we did some of that chord stuff. Jordan came up with the perfect chorus for this song. Uh, we talked about it the night before. This is what I talked about at the beginning, having these discussions. And he came in one morning into the barn and he's like, I think I got it. And he played this thing and it was perfect. Um, and so, anyway, because of that style, I'm a big fan of Peter Gabriel. I love like the old school storytelling that he did in Genesis and stuff. So I kind of put on my storytelling hat and wrote a lyric about, uh, there's two characters in the song, but the main one is about this guy who is um, sort of like a towny drunk guy in a, a pub that's weather worn and he's down there and he's like, can't figure out why he never got anywhere. And, um, anyway, this song basically takes him through a journey and this other character as well to where they're able to take control of their lives and see, see a better future. So that was me kind of getting into the spirit of the song. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about, um, I'll show you some sections and we'll go through this really quick. The time is going so It always blows quickly. by fast, doesn't it? I mean, we haven't a even answered any questions yet, so this is insane. Um, so I'm going to show you what the, uh, the tiger eye sounds like a bit. Let's see. I'll go to like a melodic. <laughs> Just want to say I, I can already hear like a diff, uh, like more of like a upper mid sort of cut a bit. You know, it's still sweet, but it's definitely there. Sure. So those notes really kind of come out. Then let's see. Again, I'm on the wrong pickup. Why does that keep happening? I'm like, why does it sound so mellow? And then a little bit later, um, there's a melody that comes in, which is like a, a theme. Now, I talked about the storytelling part. I think uh, using the, um, the technique of, of putting musical themes in a song and bringing them even in and out of the song, even if the song isn't that long, it kind of gives it that storytelling vibe because you can kind of relate that theme to a character or something. So this theme is going to come in here, and you can really hear the sweetness of... Uh, not only the alder on this guitar, but the way that Steve Blucher at DiMarzio really focused these pickups to, I don't know, they just speak. So let me try to get to that section for you.
exciting Sits a local Boston warrior Talking to his chin All right, so you can hear the way that sings on that melody, right? And you definitely delay is really important. I would even... Don't hit that note. So, uh, yeah, uh, the tone is really, really cool. Go on. So as I've, yeah. yeah, very cool. So as I've watched you playing today, and obviously over, over the years, yeah. you change pickups a lot. I do. And even during a passage like that, you're yeah. changing within the passage. What is it that makes you reach for that pickup selector? Um, I mean, for that kind of sound, uh, I, I tend to gravitate towards the uh, neck pickup because it just has a really smooth and liquidy tone to it. But sometimes you want the notes to sort of like pop out a bit and get have more um, harmonics to them. And I think that's when the bridge pickup would come in handy. So if I could, uh, let me see if I could explain it while I do it. I don't know. So I would start on the neck. Like. I keep hitting that note. Don't hit that note. If I'm going up here. Then, then the neck position is going to make those notes scream a little bit more. But for the most part... No. It also depends on the range too, you know, kind of down here it makes a little more sense to use the bridge. <laughs> What else about this song? There's kind of another melodic section where you can hear this tiger eye. Let me see if I can jump to it a bit. You can hear it really sing on that. Yeah. And also, so just to point out something that I'm doing, like there's a progression going on. It's another technique, um, I guess, when soloing and it's like a compositional thing. So you have this chord progression that's going on. <laughs> Don't hit that note. So as those chords are going by, if I'm playing a melody, um, I'm 
kind of like hitting the outlines of those chords, right? So the beginning chord here. Don't hit that note. <laughs> That's the name of this. That's the name of the workshop. That's the name Don't of the workshop. That. Don't hit that note. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, as I'm playing, you can hear how I'm outlining that those chords, right? <laughs> And I think that's even more important when, again, there's no rhythm guitar behind that, right? Mm -hmm. So, let's see. If I go to, let's see, what song is this? Come on. Yeah, you can hear some of what's going on behind that. the idea um, that's all that that's behind there there's no heavy guitars or anything one other thing in that song that I want to point out oh so you know like the uh, I guess the main chorus part there's a sort of like Genesis thing going on which you achieve by putting various chords over a pedal tone and so one of the fun things on guitar is kind of figuring out the best way of doing that and you don't want to play like chords that have too many like complicated notes or thirds and things that are going to make it sound funny. You can use those, but you have to do it in a way where you're playing two note chords um, over that bass line. So that progression, you can play it like this, C, G over C, and it's like F over C and then F minor. It's kind of a cool way of getting around that. Later on, it's like... Kind of nice. Um, play that style and it still sounds good with distortion. Yeah, 
I like those big sounding chords. I think the chorusing and the delay help with that as well. <laughs> So do those tend to those those kind of things are much easier to play on keyboards because you have two hands you can hold exactly. the pedal and then play yeah. the chords. Do so those tend to come from the keyboard or they come from your yeah, guitar? Yeah, no, those are those are keyboard chords. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of my job. Then I got to figure out how to, the best way to do that. Yeah, so that's kind of the way I figure that out. Um, also, one other thing about that song. Um, uh, All right, so there's a section in there. It's almost like a crimson. We were talking about crimson before, like a crimsony kind of ostinato guitar part. But there's a progression going on. It's like. And there's a way to also get that in the guitar part by changing the low note. So you can hear the chord progression going by by sneaking those in there. So that was another sort of arrangement thing. Let me see if I can get the guitar sound in there, get to that part. Right, so it kind of gives this driving thing. That ostinato keeps like emotion going, but you're still outlining the chords. <laughs> couple of things to point out. So do you count through all of those kind of things when you're making those kind of shifts and you're playing those different ostinatos versus right. other parts? Are you counting or playing to a click or how do you guys manage that? Um, we, you know what, they, when we're writing them that we're, you know, something like that is a repeating seven pattern. So you don't have to count too, too much. You kind of get used to, I sort of get used to the way the melody feels and where the melody lays. That's the biggest, I guess, uh, way that I stay in touch with the part if there's odd times going. I listen to the way the melody cycles and resolves. That's mm -hmm. the way I do it. Right. Yeah. Now, you've also got the uh, delay going here. Yeah. And depending on the tempo you're playing the ostinato right. at, it can kind of almost contribute a harmony to what you're, you're doing. Absolutely. Or, or a second exactly. part. Are you looking for it to do that? Um, I mean, it's cool when that happens, but uh, not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can certainly set the delay to, to do that and be a part of the the, you know, the actual part that you're playing. So it has like an interactive feel. All right. Sure. Cool. Should we do another one? Let's do it. All right. We got one more. We're the clock's ticking down. It is running down, but yeah. I hate to not miss, I hate to miss one of them. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, bust out the uh, seven string. Okay. Guitar. So this was in standard tuning, correct? This is standard. And then, so the next one is standard seven. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Not going to trip on my water bottles. All right, question is, which one is it? <laughs> no, no. This one has seven strings. <laughs> <laughs> Choose that one. I told you I can count in seven. <laughs> I can count two seven. All right. So the first question will be, yeah. tell us why the seven string on this one, why you played the part and wanted the extra low yeah. bottom end on it. Um, well, the cool thing about the seven string guitar is, is uh, you can, you know, play as normal 
as far as things are, you know, being where they should be and standing where they should be. But you have uh, one more string. So you get to have an extended range, um, which is great for, you know, when you're writing in certain keys in, you know, B and C sharp and D, uh, where you want to actually utilize those as like the lower root notes. Um, it comes in really, mm -hmm. really handy. So do you ever do tunings on a seventh string? Um, not particularly. On this album, there's a song called Viper King where I did a drop A, mm -hmm. uh, which is fun. That's a bonus track. Right, um, so it gets really heavy down right, there. But, right. Yeah. So when you then conceive of a song and say you're using the drop C guitar, yeah. you do everything in the song on that guitar so that when you play it live, you can use the oh, yeah. or do you worry about that at all? No, no, yeah. So I need, yeah, when I'm writing the song and recording it, I make sure I just use that one guitar. Otherwise, I don't know how I would change mid. That was the question, right? Yeah, no. I thought maybe there was some magic there. There, there is magic, but that's that's some serious magic. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Have the guitar magically changed. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So Pale Blue Dot yeah. is the uh, the third song that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, today. I wanted to get this one in. So Pale Blue Dot on the record is uh, the closer, and we sort of wrote it that way. This has like a, a very epic kind of feel, which I wanted to talk about how we achieved that epic sort of feel. Um, the subject matter and the uh, and the musical style really go together, right? So it has this sort of interstellar Star Warsy space sound, and the topic Pale Blue Dot is based off of a Carl Sagan speech um, that uh, where he was reflecting on the photo that the Voyager uh, spacecraft took from the edge of the solar system back towards the sun. And the Earth uh, appeared as a tiny, 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 tiny little dot. And he uh, made this great uh, reflection on that about how, like, we're, we're all just sort of floating out here together, and there might not be anybody out there to save us, and we should all be kinder to each other. And all the crazy stuff that happens in the world, all the wars and bloodshed and everything, and everything that seems so important, and love and all these things, it's all like just on this little tiny dot floating. So is this all about perspective? And I love that. It's one of my favorite uh, speeches. Right, so cool. that's the nerdy side. <laughs> so, so how do we get the, uh, the sound? First of all, uh, something interesting um, in this is uh, the, one of the main riffs came from a sound check. So we talked about that, right? So this was a Mike Mangini drum pattern that is in 19.8. And uh, yeah, it's like, OK, why would you pick 19.8, you know? <laughs> And you know, you talk about counting. How do you count something like that? So I want to tell you how I count something like that. But let me play a little bit of the 19 part and some of this sort of, uh, you know, space Star Wars-y sounding thing. So it starts off with that. I'll play you this whole intro because it's kind of interesting instead of me just talking about it. So so bear with a couple of minutes of the song.
so far. All right, so yeah, it's kind of a fun song. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that it's actually not. I should say it's 1916. The way that we're counting that. Um, but the way that I sort of wrapped my head around it is, um, I guess if you count uh, in 16th notes, four groups of four um, is 16. And then if you add a, another three, that's 19. <laughs> so, right? So, if, so you can feel it like, like this. So the riff starts, it sounds funny, but the riff starts like with a single hit on the low B. Like this. All right, so that would be the first group of 16th notes, even though they're not sounded, right? So, and then three groups of 16th notes. All right, so, and then three more. <laughs> I, actually, I ended on the downbeat of the next one. So it's like, that's 19, so. All right, that's that sound. So that's the way we're sort of counting it. Okay. That's fun, right? <laughs> um, and then to get that kind of like the intervals to, to make it have that sort of outer space type of sound, um, some of that's the scales that we're using. We use a lot of whole, whole tone scales. Um, which have this kind of sound. Um, and uh, Lydian flat seven scale, which is like. That gives that sound. And also a lot of uh, consecutive minor chords. If you listen to the main uh, riff. Um, that's a combination of using flat fives and major third intervals. And if you kind of combine those the right way, you get these really epic sounds. And that first riff, um, that... There's a lot of minor chords going on here. There's... It sounds like... And then this part, flat five major third and there's also that's whole tone right so that combination of things I think kind of gives you that sort of interstellar sound so how conscious is that decision to say that I'm going to use a Lydian dominant scale here yeah versus I'm going to use the do you I guess the question is do the scales come first or does the melody come first and then you analyze it afterward um, I, I think it's more like the composition comes first so it's like the the way that you're writing and what sounds good to your ear and maybe within that there's some theory, but it's like sort of embedded. You kind of know it already. You know what those choices are. It's sort of like knowing that when you play the blues, like you can use a pentatonic scale. Like you just know, you associate it. Um, but it's more that the writing and the melody comes first. Um, there's also uh, the verse to that song uses this, this technique. I don't know if I can do it sitting the way I am. I might have to go in classical position. But um, where you play uh, root fifth and... Uh, Ninth, like this kind of chord. It's like the prog chord of choice, right? And you'd make it minor by just lifting that ninth up a half step. And so the chorus, uh, sorry, the verses have this sort of consecutive sound like of minor chords, minor uh, or ninth to minor, um, in all different intervals, like we just talked about, going down a major third, going up a flat five, and you have something like this. Um, So even the end, playing that kind of flat five thing going there, that that sort of resolution gives that epic sound. I'm also putting the fifth below the root, so you have more of a thicker sound. 
and that harmonization of the chord, also very like orchestral sounding. All right, so, but it's played with the distortion, so that section would be something like this. Let me change positions here. <laughs> section there. You can hear what it sounds like. Yeah. Also, um, to get that kind of Star Warsy sound, I, I have to ask though. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but so one of the challenges when you have non-diatonic harmony like that yeah. is then putting a melody over it, right? And also you're harmonizing that melody as well, right? Exactly. Are you using the theory to figure that out, or is that also composed by ear? Where does that come from? Um, you know what? The the melody to that actually, even though the chords are, are sort of bizarre as far as them being all minor chords up flat fives and down major thirds, the melody sort of came naturally to me. I don't know, when I was writing the lyrics, it kind of fit in. Um, the harmonies were a little trickier. But yeah, because you have to, um, I guess you have to do it so that it does sound like it, it makes sense and it, you know, you don't want them to be too parallel sound, sounding. Mm -hmm. um, the more sort of common tones that you can use and voice leading, I think that's the best way to do that. Right. Um, also, this one section I, I just want to show you, I talked about the octaves before on, on Tethered to get that dramatic sound. I did that on this one section. I stacked them a lot. Let's go to the guitar stem to show you that. Let me see. For some reason, it's going back. You hear that going back and forth? I was going to ask if you played it that way. No, it no, no. Two I did, guitars, yeah, one picking I, up on the other? I don't know if there's like a gate going on or something, but it's causing... Anyway, um, that wasn't the best example of that. Uh, but trust me, it's stacked there. I, I, man, I was going to say, if you played that, yeah. two different tracks, that's pretty darn impressive. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and then uh, the one other thing, I'll, sh I'll show you this, let, this last thing, because uh, we should probably get to some questions, because... We're like already at about an hour and a half. Um, and it's just this melody thing that, again, um, brings out that sort of theme thing we talked about before, the single note thing, playing against uh, chords that have, again, the sort of spacey interstellar thing. Let me see if I can get to the section for you. Um, So all the compositional techniques, all those chord choices are meant to give it that sound. So if I can find the, uh, first of all, I would use this type of sound. So going back to that lead thing. <laughs> I could find 
find the keyboard stem. Let's see. I can play that part for you. So that's what's going on behind. And also uh, the um, guitar and bass, I'm sorry, the drums and bass are doing the motif from the beginning. So that sort of Star Wars-y. Without the delays. Um, they're doing that. So it, it's kind of a cool sound. It, it, you know, picking the right chords to give that effect, I think, is that's what's fun, you know? And that's what's keeping the song in the spirit and then making the, the lyrics match up and you have a cohesive uh, song. Um, the challenging thing for me on the guitar is that the key is constantly changing, mm -hmm. so that a lot of the shapes that you might be used to as a guitar player don't fit. So you have to just really be going by the chords and not, you're not, you can't like use scale shapes because they don't really match up. Keeps constantly changing. <laughs> 